Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, making history, Kamala Harris, Vice President of the United States. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. Tears and cheers during this week's inaugural ceremony installing President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Vice President Harris is a triple first, the first black, the first South Asian, and the first woman to hold the office. She becomes vice president as communities of color are suffering the ravages of a life-threatening virus under attack from re-energized white supremacists and losing ground in a down economy. With so much at stake, how do people of color celebrate her historic achievement but also hold her accountable? Joining us, Dr. Yvonne M. Spicer, mayor of Framingham, and the city's very first mayor when the town transitioned to a city in 2018. Janae Osterhelt, culture columnist for the Boston Globe and creator of the multimedia series, A Beautiful Resistance. And Radha Natarajan, executive director of the New England Innocence Project. Welcome to all of you. So I gotta start this way. What did each of you feel uh, at the moment that Vice President Harris took the oath. I'll start with you, Yvonne. I can't tell you uh, the sense of pride, the joy. I, I vacillated between smiling and crying at the same time. And, uh, you know, because I knew the ancestors were watching. All of the ancestors were clapping and cheering her on. And all of us around the country, uh, women, uh, you know, African-American women, Asian women, um, just all what she embodies. And uh, we we are just thrilled. And I know I felt such a sense of, of pride, uh, a real great day. Radha? So the first thing that I felt was, I wish Justice Sotomayor had pronounced her name correctly. <laughs> um, having, having gone through a lifetime of having your name mispronounced and knowing that that was an issue for Kamala Harris, Kamala Davy Harris, I, it was important to me and I wanted to see that. And it, Still, when she spoke and she took the oath, um, it was it was hard to feel. <laughs> hmm. Janae, you want to pick up? <clears throat> well, it was it was so many things at the same time. Like I was excited. I was also stressed because I was on deadline. <laughs> so I was like trying to report everything and keep my notes but looking at her out also I did the whole oh she came to slay so <laughs> many many feelings um but seeing a black woman um up there it, it a black woman from my HBCU a black woman of the divine nine you know aka oldest and first it's just she brought so many things with her and then to have third grid Marshall's Bible on top of her other mother and all of us who grew up in, in black communities and brown communities alike know how awesome it is to have the neighborhood auntie. So it's like to have that Bible too. It, um, I just feel like she brought a lot of us for as complicated as a woman that she is, she brought us with her in that moment. And it was very intentional in her choices from the black designer, two black, young black designers that dressed her to the Puerto Rican designer that did the pearls. I mean, everything was so intentionally done to bring us with her. Uh, Christopher Johns, I think Roger Johns is the black designer, yeah. just to- Yes, and Sergio Hudson. Right, give the shout out to the, to the right people. So all of us in this conversation, and I'm going to include myself, have been first and only somewhere. So we know that experience. Mm -hmm. So Rodney, I'm going to start with you. What can she anticipate, but at this level, being first and only? I mean, I think she knows very well what, what it means to be first. It's both, you know, all of our hopes are in her um, and I think she does such a great job of bringing all of us with her. Um, and at the same time, she's going to be nitpicked. Every single thing she does is going to be watched. Um, it's sort of this um, elevation of her 
as an ideal with, that she can't ever, that no person can ever meet. And I think she's frankly used to that because she's been mm -hmm. the first so many times. And I think she does a really good job of, um, of being able to hold that, hold all of those things and knowing that that's coming. Janae? I agree. Um, she's been the first and only many times before, like I'm sure all of us, you know, talking today have been and many black and brown women have been um, the first and only in the room so many times. And, you know, the stakes are high and the criticism's higher. Like any mistake she makes will be 10 times as worse as something that a mediocre white man does, you know, down to, I mean, the vote cover. I mean, anything she does is going to be amplified and just picked apart in every single way. It's almost, you know, when you are a black woman in the spotlight like that, you don't, they try to strip away your humanity. Um, to, to your point, it, it's, it, she's, everything she does now is because she's like this, both a superhuman to some and a supervillain to others. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think she's used to it, but I also think none of us fully, I mean, we're still human. So, you know, I just hope that the people around her continue to support her and leverage her. And I think we can hold her accountable, but also defend her when things are clearly racist and sexist. Yvonne. You know, uh, you, you both hit it on, uh, on the nail, uh, you, you know, because when you are a woman uh, of color, an African-American woman, and certainly being the first, uh, I am the first mayor of my city, and everything you said has come to fruition. But I think the saving grace is, I think, with, uh, with age comes further grounding and wisdom and, and knowing who you are and whose you are um, certainly propels you in this job. And, and you, you do anticipate the, the criticism. Um, but I also say having that support network around you, it becomes critically important. And you know that she does have that, you know, being uh, an AKA, uh, she's got a whole army behind her. And so, I look at it as uh, it comes with the job. It also is a very difficult job at a very difficult time, a critical time. And uh, you're right. Every step of the way, uh, she's going to be, you know, watch, judge. And, uh, you know, and we just need to be there to support her and, and support, uh, you know, President Biden and, the, and their leadership, because I think we, we are at a reckoning time in this country. And I think it can make a huge difference leveraging the power of black women. So let's break down this this intense scrutiny that you've all said is coming her way and coming her way um, intensely. Right. One of the things that you mentioned was here she is. She's a symbol um, of a group, all of us. But yet she's an individual. So right away, you know, you're in trouble because it's just breathing. You, you're going to upset somebody or not do the right thing. So I'm clear about, or maybe I'm not clear, and you should say as a way of answering the second part of this question, which is what we can expect from the racists. That's, that's, you know, how do you expect that to come? But there's a, going to be a lot of intense scrutiny and not some kind things said to her up from the communities of color. Um, and what do you expect of that to look like? So, Rodna, I'm starting with you. So I think... You know, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on what the racists are going to say about her. I think we already know that. I think we've already seen that. So let's not even spend time on that. Okay. I think what we really need to talk about is, you know, so she hold, she has, she makes us feel that things are possible. And that's huge, right? That just that feeling of knowing that, you know, all of our multicultural families, our daughters, you know, it's that there's hope for us. There's possibility. In addition to that, she has a history where the policies that she endorsed and that she presided over as a district attorney, as an attorney general, harmed communities of color. But I think the point, I think one thing that's important is right now we are traumatized. And I'm not sure when we will feel ready to not just to, to, to come out of that trauma and actually hold her accountable. I think I think we have to do that. I think it, we owe it to her and to all of our communities to do that. But I think it might be hard to do that right now because we just feel a sense of relief that we need. We need that joy right now. 
Mm -hmm. um, Yvonne Spicer, Ratha makes an interesting point. Um, there are some things to be quite critical of her in terms of her prosecutorial past. That was an issue when she was campaigning for president. But as uh, Ratha says, we're on a we're at a time of extreme trauma, too, because of all the other stuff that I mentioned at the beginning of the show. So mm -hmm. how do we then uh, begin to hold her accountable or do we as do we give her a moment? You know, well, she's she's going to be held accountable for sure, no matter what. But I do agree that, you know, we don't want to give those the uh, the uh, the opposition and ad adversaries too much airtime because this, this wor the work that is ahead of her is so important. And there's so much healing that needs to happen and bridging the divide. And so if we're focusing our energy on moving the needle forward and bridging the divide. And I do believe the ability to listen, the ability to hear not only those that have been supportive of her, but those who have been adversaries and listening very carefully. And I believe she has that power and that ability because just looking at her life, you know, it is it is a cross sectional of, of people, races, cultures, and she can bridge that divide. And I want to give her a fair shot at doing that. Janae. I, I guess I feel a little bit different. I don't think any one person can bridge the divide. I think it's like a collective action that has to be taken and I think I think it, no one is running away from her prosecutorial past. I feel like when she was running for president it was nationally discussed and then when she became the VP pick it was nationally discussed and on inauguration day you know any number of abolitionists and activists spent most of the day talking about it more so I actually don't think the black community and the activist community has shied away from holding her accountable for the last year and a half since it's become a possibility that she'd be in the White House um, on some level or another. I do think that we can have joy and celebrate um, and also recognize that both of those people are conservative Democrats. They are not radical progressives. Um, and for me, I don't think it's about saying, look at all these terrible things you did, because we've been doing that for a year and a half. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like we're deaf. We're, like, she knows we know. Like, it's been discussed. Um, for me, it's she's here now. She's in the White House, and so is he. So what are we going to do to collectively keep them delivering what they promised? How are we going to keep them from writing bad checks? of equity, justice, mm -hmm. and liberation. And mm -hmm. to me, that's not so much about saying, and you did this, this, and this 10 years ago. It's about saying, how are you gonna show me as as a, our Congresswoman, Ayanna Presley says, policy is a love language. So how are you gonna do that? And how are we gonna do that with our little votes? You know, our everyday votes that make a difference in who is representing us and, and make sure that power is democratized. So for me, that is what accountability will look like going forward. So let me pick up on that, uh, Janae, and ask you to respond to this and everybody else. All of you said in some fashion that the mistake made with President Obama was the awe of the historic achievement and feeling as though, whoo, he got there, that's big enough. And then not doing the collective follow-up that Janae says is so important. So... What uh, what are you looking to see that measures there is collective follow up and and some in response to that collective follow up? Janae, I'm going to start with you. What can those in the collective do um, so as not to be awed by the moment and get distracted by that and consider that to be the achievement? Part of it is like love her the way your family loves you. Your family loves you, but they don't hesitate to check you. Checking someone is a love language. Like, mm -hmm. so part of it is that. And then the other part of it is what happened in Georgia. Like, we can't just look away and say, whoo, it's fixed. Because it's not fixed. It was never fixed. It's, it's infinitely broken and the work is lifelong and it just passes on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So it's like, do the little votes. Vote, you know, who's on your school board? Who's the sheriff? Who's the mayor? Like things that I don't think we always civically um, engage and recognize. And all of these things are from 
are able to buy groceries to the type of playground you have. And those, that type of collective power is how we shift the power in DC to me. Mm-hmm. Rhonda, how do we how do we express the fact that we are holding her accountable collectively? What's the best way you see um, it happening? I mean, I certainly think that what we've seen in terms of movements, in terms of grassroots organizations, in terms of people in the streets saying what we need and not stopping and knowing that, you know, it's not even that it's broken. It's that it, it was intended to be this way. Right. And that that's what we we need a complete transformation but we're talking about kamala harris and she really doesn't represent the transformation not like that um and so i think you know to janae's point i think that you know there are folks who are now in the administration who do believe in transformation more than she does there are people who uh who are now elected um to the legislature who believe that there are people locally there are district attorneys um, that we can hold accountable. There are, you know, so there are things that we can do in our communities. Um, but I will say that, you know, while we do know her past and we can't keep harping on that, you know, I don't know that she's really, um, Mm. I don't, I don't think that she's really, uh, owned up to those things. And I think when we talk about truth and reconciliation and healing, I think she needs to see and recognize the harm that was, um, that, that she really did preside over. Yvonne, how would you add to that? I, you know, I, I, I will say that I, a lot of this work does happen at the local level. And we did learn a lot through Georgia of the power of the people and each person and how one vote can matter. Ask Julia Mejia. You know, these are things that uh, I think collectively as a community, we can't go back in the corner and not participate in the process. And, and, and as a local leader, that's one of the things. I can have a great initiative, but if I don't have the people pushing that initiative along with me, it makes it a lot more t- difficult. And collectively, I think I look at this administration. I, I First of all, I, I certainly agree that having many voices and diverse voices in that cabinet And voices that I know are former mayors who I know are boots on the ground people. They understand what how to move this work collectively. And that's all of us working in in our individual states, our cities, our towns. That's how something happens. We can have the policy coming out of Washington. But what it looks like on the ground is up to the local leaders and the local community. And that's all of us working together. So that's one of the things that I would like to see, you know, hold true to the promises around economic recovery. Uh, First and foremost, getting this uh, virus under control. All of those things are going to impact education, healthcare, everything we do in this country. And we just have to be real clear about what we're doing together collectively and how we're going to implement it collectively. So fair or not, because of who she is, I'm going to guess there's going to be some expectation of her to speak to certain issues um, Mm -hmm. in ways that other folks in that position haven't. And we can think of her as transforming that vice presidential slot in a way that it has never been before, because she has is bringing, as you all pointed out earlier, all of herself into the role. So in the transformation what would you, how would you like her to see it transformed other than, I mean, you know, she's going to have to do some official duties, but really in terms of pushing policy and making her voice heard in a larger way inside with the rest of those people who are trying to make change, how do you think that she could, could do that, Janae? I don't think Kamala's quiet. So I, I think that Kamala is very uh capable of making her voice heard and and i she showed us during the presidential debates that she's not afraid to hold biden accountable in any way um so that's not a concern for me at all my concern is how um how good of a listener will she be when it comes to listening to cory bush to Ayanna Presley, to AOC, to the many, um, you know, liberators who are, who we have elected, you know, how will she reach her arms out to her sisters? Mm. And that's what I want to know. And I, and I also, 
how will journalists treat her? It's something I'm thinking about. And the only way we can hold her accountable to the past is if journalists ask her the right questions when given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like when we see the next big deep profile, hopefully with Essence or some amazing black media, you know, will she be willing to have those conversations and those conversations and her listening ears, will they make it to Biden? Will they make it, you know, to policy? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where my mind is kind of at. Yvonne. Oh, you know, I just come back to there's there's a lot riding on those shoulders, a lot riding on those shoulders and and a lot to unpack, too. And, you know, yes, we are all responsible for our history, but also too trying to take collective experiences in how do we move forward? Like we all have dealt with some really horrific things over the last, I'd say, 10 months, especially and uh, collectively as a country. And we've been assaulted. And we have to also go through our own grieving process because we, we haven't even begun to deal with that. And But once again, an opportunity for us to collectively look at what has been done and how do we do better? What is going to be the doing better? What is it going to look like? What is it going to feel like? And articulating that in a way that it is crystal clear. And what does it mean? And I, and I look at future leaders, too. How are we laying the foundation? For those that will come behind us, you know, the, 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 the wonderful Amanda Gormans here, you know, we want to make sure we are laying the foundation for a bright future for all of these future leaders. And, uh, you know, and I, I just say I, I'm, I'm giving her some space to kind of get her feet into this position and then being able to make sure that our voices are heard and listened to and put forth in a way that can be uh, 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 realized in, a, uh, in, in actionable steps that can happen across this country. Now, um, you believe that she can transform the the role of vice president just because of who she is, just because that's going to make a difference. Did, and and why do you say that? You know, I say it because first of all, we, there, when you are the first. And there's no roadmap. You get to create it the way you need it as the first woman ever to be in this seat and, and coming with such a wealth of experience in her life, too. You know, she gets to bring all of that with her. Um, and so I, I think she has an opportunity to be an influencer and an influencer across all different divisions, you know, the cabinet, but also throughout the entire federal uh, uh, process here, too. So I just, you know, I I don't want to I don't want to put too much on her shoulders, but I don't want her to be shortchanged in there, you know, because traditionally the vice president role is one that is behind the president. I see this as more as a partnership Mm -hmm. working alongside the president. Radna, what do you say? I mean, I think that definitely being a first, she doesn't have the roadmap. But in addition, I think that Biden has made it very clear that he wants her to be a partner. Um, I think that's, I don't think that that's a secret. I think it's very clear. And I think they've been unified. But one huge difference here is that she's going into a 50-50 Senate. So she is going to have a role that is bigger. And we're going to see her voice there in a way that we haven't seen before. So I think the context, both with the president that she is the vice president to, as well as the Senate, is gonna make sure, and her being a first, and who she is as a person, we're gonna hear from her. Um, And I think we should, and I'm glad we will. What's the one thing you'd like to see her do now in these early 100 days um, Mm. that you'll you'll see her do and you'll go, "Mm mm-hmm, okay, good. Rod says, since I'm talking to you, what do you think? Mm. Well, criminal justice is my thing. So Mm. abolish the federal death penalty, day one. Um, Mm. Work on and support revoking EDPA, which is preventing people from being able to go back to court and get their convictions overturned. Um, So criminal justice, mass incarceration, that's what I want her to focus on. Janae. I actually agree. I want to, I think her... Starting with criminal justice will be a way of her taking account for her role in in the things that have disproportionately hurt her people, um, our people. So that to me would be a really good show of faith and a show of like, 
that's who I was and this is who I'm growing into. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yvonne. I got to go back to my, my, my main base and that's education. Um, because truly when, when children and particularly children of color are given those great opportunities to be educated and to have, uh, equitable, equitable education in this country, we can avoid a lot of other ills such as poor health care, uh, incarceration, all of the things that limit particularly black and brown children. Um, so I would love to see uh, some energy put into uh, uh, dollars for education, quality teaching, encouraging people to be teachers, to be in the classroom, and especially looking in areas of STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, and building pathways for our children to have brighter futures than they are having right now. Well, it looks like the STEM thing has uh, definitely happened because the emphasis is on science now as the first yeah. way of dealing with the COVID crisis. So you may have your wish earlier than anybody else, uh, Yvonne Spicer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping. All right. Well, that's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Thanks to all of our guests. Thank you for joining us. Stay with us as we continue our conversation on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> 